Well, good morning and Happy New Year and welcome to 2022. <sighs> it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Last year at this time, we weren't able to do this, right? So, you know, in everything, give thanks because uh, we could things could be worse. And so we're just uh, thankful for being here today. So let's just start our year in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. We thank you, Lord. For your goodness to us for your mercy that is new every morning we thank you father for your hand of protection upon family members as they traveled home as they came to visit we thank you father for the ability to be able to do that to come together and just uh, spend time together as families and now father we are thankful that we can come together and spend time together as part of god's family this morning to worship you and to lift up your name. So, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place. Lord, fill our hearts to overflowing. Help us, O oh God, to look into this new year with hope, expectation, and believing that you are going to do great things this year, uh, not just in our lives, not just in this congregation, but in our community and the surrounding area. Lord, we're, we're praying and believing for a wonderful move of God that's going to see people come to Christ and grow in, in you, Lord, and, to become, and us to become more like Jesus. So, Lord, may everything we say and do this morning bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, looking ahead at the temperature, it looks like we're going to be sort of out of the deep freeze, so... Uh, anyway, all that aside, it was, uh, we got a little taste of Manitoba winter again, so uh, somebody said, I don't know why I'm living here. I says, well, or <laughs> you chose to come to Manitoba. <laughs> it's just life. So anyway, our week ahead is uh, back to normal, Wednesday, 9 a.m. Uh, prayer here at the church, 10, men's fellowship, and then next Sunday, 9.45, our adult Bible study and morning worship at 11 and I don't think there's anything else. Uh, we can't go to the uh, uh, personal care home uh, again at this time because it's been locked down because of all of the cases that are around about. And so we uh, are, would leave, but as I said to Leah, at least we got one Sunday to sing carols together. So uh, I was thankful for that as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to our, uh, our worship team and they're gonna come and lead us in worship this morning. Good morning and Happy New Year. I just want to start our service um, with a scripture from Psalm 57. It's the Psalm of David and it's after he has uh, escaped from Saul. He's been in hiding and he acknowledges that God is the one who has protected him. God is the one who has seen him through to victory. And I think I'll read just a few verses. It starts in verse 9. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. This is his response to this recognition of the Lord saving him from his enemy. I will sing of you amongst the people. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. And verse 11, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. I'm reminded of something I read. It was back in um, last September, and it's really stuck with me. And it's just a note from the NIV Bible it it about a couple of uh, psalms. And it summarizes things. It says, wherever God's saving power is displayed, his glory is revealed. So let's, uh, you may stand or remain seated, but let's sing together, to God be the glory. Life and atonement for 
to be thinking back a little bit to what Pastor Evan uh, shared with us last week. Um, not his words precisely, but it got me thinking, like, at Christmas time, we often are focused on the baby in the manger. And uh, Pastor Evan reminded us that we need to, to have our focus on the reason that Jesus came, the purpose that Jesus came to the world. And it's a purpose that has not changed and that purpose led him to the cross at Calvary. So let's sing together, lead me to Calvary. Lead me to the place where I think on what Jesus has done for me.
Lord, we do thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, Lord. We thank you that um, there's nothing that we can do to earn that, to earn that grace, Lord, that you offer us, Lord. And so we just thank you once again. We thank you, Lord, that you did not stay in the grave. You did not stay on the cross. You did not stay in the grave, but you rose to be with the Father again, and you have given us that same opportunity to for resurrection life, that same life that was within Jesus that lives within us, Lord. And so we thank you that as we gather around, as we symbolically gather around the communion table, Lord, as we, we remember you, as we take these emblems, Lord, we thank you for your presence, Lord, and for your grace and for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. I find it appropriate that the first Sunday of every month and the first Sunday of every year, we start with communion. I don't think there's a, a better way to do that, to start a year, than to remember what Jesus has done for us. When we come to communion, we often jump right to the point of remembering where Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that we're to remember and how we're to remember. As I was thinking about that this week, I was thinking, you know, I want to just step back. And I, I look in Luke chapter 23, and, and it's, the, it's the death of Christ. And um, Marge is going to play a song while we take up our, have our communion. But let me read this in chapter 23, verse 34. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus was cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came to gather together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. And we need to remember at that moment in time, darkness truly had descended over all creation. The light of the world, seemingly to humanity, had been put out. There was no light. There was the word that had been with God and was God had been silenced to us. To our senses, everything was, wasn't working. This wasn't the plan. That's not how the disciples thought it was going to work out. This wasn't how the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders had it figured out in their head how the Messiah was going to save them. I was listening to the radio as I went to pick up Sharon about how because of this great sacrifice in John 1, John says that all who believe in him shall be called the sons of God. Thus fulfilling the prophecy to Abraham that his Descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sands of the sea. And sometimes we forget in our rushing around that it was a tremendous sacrifice. Because in that moment when Christ became sin and in, took on the iniquity of us all, his heavenly father, the one that he had had constant communion and fellowship with all his life, all of his known existence at that moment had to turn his back on his only begotten son because he had become sin for us. It, it wasn't just a little thing. It was a tremendous thing that Jesus did for us.
And so we need to, when we, we come to take communion, remember that seeming, no matter how easy it seems for us, it was, it was hard, it was painful, it was difficult, and yet it has changed the course of history forever. No longer do we have to go to a priest and, and pour out and, you know, confess our sins and, and then take a, a lamb and, you know, kill it. You know, I, I can see, can you imagine having to do that, to having every year to take a lamb? And, and when you, and, you know, there was other sacrifices where it was a bird or it was a, you know, whatever it might be. Things were constantly dying because of our sin. And finally, Jesus came so that all of that ended. Once for all, for all time. And God the Father, when that sacrifice was given to him, put his stamp on it and said, done. It is, when Jesus said it is finished, it was finished. No more. This is it. And as much as the enemy thought he'd won a great victory that day, he was in for a rude surprise. Because Jesus showed up on his front doorstep and said, give me the keys of death and hell. You no longer rule. Isn't that amazing? And that's why we can say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For Christ has swallowed it up, right? So, we've been through two years of tough slugging. We're not going to let anything defeat what God has done. Not only in us, but what God wants to do in our community. Amen? So take heart. This isn't your sermon, but take heart. Because what Jesus has done, he's done for us all. We're going to receive this morning our, our uh, communion. And as always, we invite you to just come up one at a time or a family at a time to, to pick it up and, uh, and then return to your seats. And then we will have communion. And uh, so I'm going to ask March to play. This song is called uh, Leave Me, is it? No, near, the near the Cross. Near the Cross. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 11 for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us partake together. We thank you, Father, that you are still the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has made it possible for us, Lord, to become sons and daughters of God, heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Through him, Father, we have eternal life. Through him, our sins have been forgiven. Through him, we have remission of sin. Through him, we have hope in you, hope for eternity. We pray, Father, that you would guide us and you would keep us. We pray for healing upon bodies that are suffering today, Father, for those that need a healing touch. God, you are able to flow through their bodies by your Holy Spirit, and your healing power can raise them up. Father, even as it did in days of old when you took people who had passed away who had died and you spoke over them father 
and they came back to life. You can still do the same. You can still heal bodies that doctors can't heal. You can still heal things that people have thrown up their, their arms and said, I guess I have to live with this. Father, you are still the healer. You're the savior. You're the hope of the world. So Lord, help us to put our trust in you. In Jesus' name. I don't know if we have a volunteer to go and try and run, run our thing back there. Just do have a PowerPoint. So, oh, do you want to go? <laughs> don't have to if you don't want to. down to the should say should have a should have a fireplace on the picture so it's, there we go As we leave an, an old year and we enter into a, a new year, we have the opportunity to make a new path on fresh paper. This morning I was thinking, uh, through this past week, I was going to say fresh snow, but I thought that was a little bit too much because we've had a little bit too much snow, although we're thankful for it. We've needed it. It's a fresh piece of paper, a fresh blanket of snow that has no mistakes in it. And it's so easy to keep doing the same thing that we've been doing over and over uh, because it's what we think we must do to, to live life, to, to be like this. Is anyone else a little chilly in here? Thermometers, the thermostat set at 22, so if you're chilly, you can put your coat on. I am not. I'm always warm. So I'm sure over the last two years, it feels like our lives are, are out of our control and are being dictated to us um, with very little room for us to maneuver, to do things that we would like to do. The temptation that we have all faced and that we probably have all given into a time or two at least, is to allow frustration to be the thing that controls our tongues. And we have had our own personal rants about COVID and the people making decisions. And I completely understand. I completely understand. And there have been times I wish I had some hair to pull out because I'm sure I would have, you know, pulled some out. And I have had my share of rants. Let me give you a little piece of pastoral advice, okay? Make sure the person you are going to rant to, number one, they can handle it, okay? Number two, make sure the person you're going to rant to knows that you just need to blow off some steam. This is, you know, it just builds up after a while and you need to be able to get it out. And, and I say this because mental health experts will tell you if you don't get that whether it's frustration or anger or bitterness or whatever it is out of your system, it begins to affect your physical body. So it's okay if you have someone safe that you can go and blow some steam off to, all right? And, uh, but it, here's the key. Be careful what words you use while you're blowing off steam. Because remember this, the people that are, de that are in positions of authority are trying their best with the limited knowledge that they have in order to keep people from getting sick or from dying. They're not out there actually trying to make our lives miserable. So 
back to what I want to look at this Sunday. This Sunday, I want to look at the power of words. Specifically, I want to look at how we need to build each other up, especially as we struggle through this pandemic. And so I got kind of a starting and an ending point uh, in our scripture verses here this morning. The heart, Proverbs 16, 23, and 24, the heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Proverbs 25, 18 flips all the way to the other side. Like a club or a sword or a sharp arrow is one who gives false testimony against a neighbor. The writer of Proverbs has two pieces of counsel here for us in our situation that we live in today. Number one, a person who is wise learns to use his words to teach those around him. I think you can go to the next slide. There you go. And B, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul. They build people up rather than tear them down. And don't we have enough of people tearing people down? People listen to what you say. Small people tend to listen more carefully than we give them credit for. I'm reminded of my uncle who had his grandson in the vehicle with him a few times. And one day he is with his daughter and she says to him, I don't know where he picked up this phrase, idiot drivers. He said, a few days later, my uncle told me he was driving with his daughter and grandson when someone cut him off and he said, oh, that idiot driver. And instantly, his daughter knew exactly where her, her son had picked up that term. We, we teach even when we don't know we are teaching. So guard your words so that what you are teaching will have a positive impact on the people who are listening. In a time of trouble, there will be mu a multitude of complainers and grumblers. But someone who has pleasant words will always be welcome at any table. It isn't just the grumbling and the complaining, though. It's, it's gossiping and tarot bearing and, and so many other kinds of negative conversation that slowly drags everyone down around you. When I first moved here and I was golfing with the seniors uh, and was golfing with Eleanor Renwick, after about five or six holes of golfing with her for the first time, she says, I have a new name for you. Yeah, but no matter how bad the shot was and no matter what the person said, I would say, yeah, but at least you're on the fairway or yeah, but we will be able to find your ball or yeah, but your swing was so much better that time. Do we build people up with pleasant words or do we tear them down or worse, stomp on them when they are already up to their neck in mud? We, we need to understand, we need to be able to discern who we're talking to. What do they need today? What is it that is, that is needful for them? We have, enough, we have enough negative stuff in the world. We don't need to have any more of that. God didn't ca ca tell us to go out and, and preach negative stuff. He said to go and preach the gospel, which is good news, right? Proverbs 18.21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. How powerful are your, our words? Both death and life are in the power of our words. Those words put together should tell you, be careful, little tongue, what you say. Remember that little chorus that we used to sing growing up? Be careful, little tongue, what you say. Be careful, little tongue, what you say. For your father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little tongue, what you say. We need to be careful about what we say. Choose your words. If you have nothing good to say, don't say anything. I'm not going to focus on the negative side of this verse because that needs little explanation. But I want us to, to look on the other side, that there is life in what we say. There's life. I want you to take a moment and think back on the number of times someone has said something to you in your life that has been such a positive, uplifting experience. So I want, I want you to do that. I want you to close your eyes. Okay? I want you to think. 
can you remember a time when somebody said something to you that that you just needed in that moment you got it got it in your who, who wants to tell me one thing somebody that somebody said Michelle you're loved <laughs> what a wonderful thing right anybody else Right? Right? And I always tell Mar <laughs> and I always I always tell Marge, most of the time when we make a mistake, nobody else knows it but us. Right? <laughs> right? And so it, it builds us up to hear people. It it makes makes us feel more confident to continue doing what we need to do. When you look back on those words before you say anything to anyone about anything, think about how you would feel if, so, if you could impart those words to someone else. How, how you could lift them up by simply saying something that you, sometimes, I'm gonna tell you a little secret, sometimes we say things that are not, how do I say, we haven't thought about it, we just said something that and all of a sudden, we don't realize that we've lifted that other person up. God wants us to be lifter-uppers. One of our mandates here on earth is to spread the good news. And that requires that we say words that express good news, right? Does, does not mean being positive. It means words that express the heart of the good news. What's the heart of the good news? Hope, right? I mean, hope is in Christ. Hope in in our everlasting life hope in God hope in tomorrow why do we have that hope because we have Jesus right that's our that's who we place our hope up in if you think you can maintain hope on your own you're mistaken our hope is not based in in what anything humans say it's based in God and when somebody is moved by the Spirit, even though they might even not even know they're being moved by the Spirit to say something to you that builds you up, that was God's doing. That was God at work in a small way in somebody's words. And how many people could we build up in one day? How many people do we sh rub shoulders with that we could build up in one day just by having a positive word. You know those times where you hold back because you're thinking of saying something and then you're like, oh, I just can't just hold back, you know? I know that. Because I wish that I would have said it at that point. I did not know that that was going to be so as it did that time in my life because I, I truly felt it. I think that the lesson for myself is when I feel that, I just yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't hold back. I think it's like the wheel of God that's working yep. underneath that face. Yeah. Abs yeah. Absolutely. And that and that is it. Isn't it when we want to say something, how many times do we check and we go, oh, yeah, no. Ah, mm. No. When there's something that God puts on your heart, you don't even know. It's, it's something that's going to build that person up. You don't even know it. You just say, I want to, you know, don't hold back good words. You know, don't hold back the, the, the blessings that are in your words. Let it come out, right? You know, it'll come out and you're going to be watering seeds that you don't even know were planted, right? But they're there, right? So, our good news, our hope is based on nothing less than Jesus Christ and the finished work of Calvary. That's what our hope is based on. So whatever happens, whatever happens, you know, our hope isn't in that. Our hope isn't in what the doctors can figure out about COVID. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope isn't in, in what technology can fix. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is, is in him, not what, what, not what man can do, but in him. 
Proverbs 20:15 says there is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Over the past couple of years, we've been subjected to way too much information. I want you to notice my words here, information. Information can come in the guise of personal opinion, uh, misunderstandings, false information, social media, news channels, I don't care. We get way too much information. We, we don't gain any knowledge, but we get lots of information. You know, uh, we're getting we're not being told if what we are hearing is true or if the people that are, are saying it have the knowledge to say what they're saying. What we do know is that when it comes to information, there's a vast sea of it out there. And how much is true is yet to be determined. It's a huge sea of information, but not all of it's true, right? Knowledge, on the other hand, like wisdom, takes time to get. I read on my Facebook page a, a, quite a while ago someone who said, I've researched this. And immediately I thought, well, where did you go to research this? Are, are you qualified to interpret the data that, that, you know, the raw data that's coming out or, you know, so you've researched it? Have you, have you went to a medical school or have you went to a technolo techni technical school and, and, you know, got a degree in figuring out how to you know, understand the data that's coming at you? Or are you, just, or are you just regurgitating something that you heard somebody else say or read or write? So much information, so little knowledge, and absolutely no wisdom. I took three and a half years of intense theological study most people only take three. I did, three and a half. So I, we, we went through so much just to be able to stand, understand that some prophecy is meant for Israel. Some is meant for the church. Some is meant for both at different times. Scripture needs to be kept in context. context. If Scripture isn't in context, it has no... There's no text. There's nothing. It's nothing if you don't keep it in te context, not only of the scripture that it's written around, but also the, the background, the, the culture that was written in. And then you take that and you begin to understand how and what Jesus is trying to say to us, right? You know, when he said, take up your cross and follow me, that was in the context of culture. But there's something that he was saying to us, right? What was it? Well, then we must put to death the old nature of humans, you know, that old sinful nature. We were, we were constantly being challenged to understand what the scriptures were saying, generally. And then what was the Holy Spirit saying to me? And then what was the Holy Spirit trying to say through me to people that I would be preaching to? We had learned men and women of God who spent years studying God's word. I look back on them and, and I think how blessed I was to have some of these people. Some of them were definitely characters, all right? They had definite character, but they were wonderful men and women of God. They, they had studied God's word and they gave to us as best they could the whole counsel of God and they told us that what we needed to do as pastors and ministers was to preach and teach the whole counsel of God not just our pet things and then almost 40 years of ministry I just stand there and I've, I have pastored longer than my dad That's, <laughs> it's hard to believe and I want to tell you something. There is nothing new under the sun. Some of the things that come back, and I mean come back, are come, you know, they're not new. Somebody just rediscovered something and brings it back out and, you know, oh my goodness, I've seen this before. The problem with some of the things that we hear is they're about 60% truth, you know? But, I, I, I always think about that. What if, what if, what if my rifle was only sixty percent accurate? <laughs> you know, what if, what if you're sewing, and and your sewing machine is only 
work, you know, is only sewing a straight line 60% of the time. You know? What if you were riding your horse, Autumn, and your horse only bucked 40% of the time? <laughs> you know? There's something you would do, right? You would do something about the problem. I know for me, if, if that was happening with my rifle, I'd be back at the range trying to sight it in. And, and as my dad always said, your rifle shoots straighter than you, son. But if I found out that my rifle wasn't shooting straight, then i want to know why it's not shooting straight. And then I would take it to a professional who would know how to fix it. They're getting harder and harder to find, I found out. So when I speak, I want my words to be true. I want my attitude to be right. I want my motivation to be acceptable in God's sight. That's why when I pray, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. It's about, God, let, let what I am going to say be acceptable. You know, none of you know that this isn't the sermon I had ready. <laughs> I... I came to the church on Saturday yesterday, and I'm going, this isn't right. I had to rewrite, go through, pray, get the right sermon for today. <laughs> Our words must bring knowledge. They must bring truth to the table, not just information. Our words must bring hope into people's lives, not just be nice. Our words must bring life to people. Or why are we talking at all? We must learn to let our words bring sweetness into situations where there has been nothing but agony and despair. We are God's ambassadors here on earth. And we need to speak his words. Isaiah 55, 10, 11 says this. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven... And do not in return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return void to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Like, like the rain, right? Like the rain that comes down and waters the earth, right? It, I, I was thinking of the desert, the, um, what is it called, the Rainbow Desert? No, that's not right. Um, in the States. And, they, and it, it can be dry, 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 and then you get one little rain over it, and all of a sudden, all over the place, comes life. Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But his words, when you are long gone, when we are dust, will our words still be having an impact in people's lives? Well, what will we say to our children? Will it affect their children and their children's children and their children's children up to the seventh and eighth and ninth generations? Is what we are doing, what we're doing going to impact people? And I am here to tell you, sometimes we think it won't. But I'm telling you, it will. For as your words are like rain, it will bring forth wonderful things. They... And as we put God's words in our mouths and speak it out, it will not return void. They will not pass away. John 1, 1 to 5 says, In the beginning was the word, this is one of my favorite verses, and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 
he is the word. Let his word flow out of you this year so that you might water ground that has been dry, that the seeds that has been planted down through the years will spring forth and bring forth much fruit. May we be his instruments in his hands to proclaim his glory and his word this year. Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for a new year. We, we head into the unknown, but we don't head into the unknown with trepidation and fear and worry and anxiety on our hands. We head into this new year knowing that walking by our side is the Lord of all creation. We, we head into this new year, Father, as explorers, as adventurers, looking where we might be going, where we might be being used by you, where we might spread your word, where we might see, Father, beautiful new vistas as God, by his Holy Spirit, waters this land, that we have a small part in that, that we can behold the majesty and the power and the glory and the love of God at work. Father, this is a new year, and we are not going to hold back. When you, when you nudge us to say something, when you nudge us to, to go somewhere, when you nudge us, Lord, to, to go and share, even if it's just coffee or tea or a piece of pie, we're going to go. We're going to do what you've called us to do. We are going to be your ambassadors in this place that you've put us and we are going to bring the good news of Jesus Christ and we're going to share it around so that fear and anger and bitterness and anxiety can all be put away not by might not by power but by your spirit so may you bless your people this year may you bless them so that they will have boldness to go. May you bless them with wisdom to give them, Father, the right words to say. May you bless them, Father, with discernment so that they will know when and where and who to say it to. And may you bless them, Father, with a harvest that they will not be able to bring in on their own. We will be like Peter and James. We'll have to call over Andrew and John so that we can get all the fish into the boat. And that our boat, Lord, will be so full it begins to sink. Fill your churches, Lord, with people who are hungry for your word and for your presence. And Lord, we be believe it begins with us today. We ask you be with us now, Father, as we go from this place. Guide us, direct us, and keep us, Father, in perfect unity with you and with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God be with you this week. God keep you in perfect peace.